As we have seen, ions are charged particles, and they are formed when electrons are transferred between atoms. Ionic compounds are made up of oppositely charged ions, and so we will have positive ions that have been formed because they have lost negative electrons, and there will be negative ions, and these have been formed because those atoms gained negative electrons to become negatively charged ions. The ions in an ionic compound are held together by strong electrostatic forces of attraction, which is a very complicated sounding phrase, and it's a very important phrase. So let's unpick it. The word electrostatic means that we are referring to positively and negatively charged particles. In this case, we are talking about the ions that are positively and negatively charged. It's an attractive force, and so that means it is holding those ions together. And I'm showing that here with red lines to show that attractive force. You wouldn't need to draw that in an exam. And they're strong electrostatic forces of attraction, and that means that a lot of energy would be needed to break them. And it is this strong electrostatic force of attraction that is the ionic bond. It is the force that holds the ions together. An ionic compound is actually a giant structure of ions, sometimes referred to as a three-dimensional ionic lattice. And the word giant is referring to the fact that we don't just have one positive ion and one negative ion, we've actually got a huge number of ions. And the word lattice is referring to the fact that we have got a regular repeating pattern throughout the structure. There are two main ways of showing the lattice structure of an ionic compound, and I think the best way to demonstrate them is to gradually build them up. And so if we start with a two-dimensional slice through an ionic compound, you can see that we've got alternating positive and negative ions in a regular pattern. And the electrostatic forces of attraction between these oppositely charged ions will be acting in all dimensions. And so you can see that this ion here has got four oppositely charged ions around it in that same plane in two dimensions. And if we gradually introduce another layer, and another layer, and another layer, you can see that this pattern doesn't just repeat in two dimensions, it repeats in three dimensions as well. And so every ion will actually have six oppositely charged neighbours, and those electrostatic forces of attraction will be between that ion and all six of its neighbours. And so they're acting in all directions. And the arrangement of ions that I'm showing here will continue in all directions as well. I'm just showing a small sample of a three-dimensional lattice. Sodium chloride, which is the only lattice that you need to be able to identify and recognise, would have billions and billions of ions in it. I'm just showing a small snapshot of that lattice structure. Another way to show the lattice structure is to have a cube marked out by lines and to have each of the oppositely charged ions at the points where the lines meet. And so you can see that the two different structures do look similar. They have in common the fact that they have both got different particles. What's different in the second one is that the charges aren't shown, but I have included a key showing that the blue ions are the positive sodium ions, Na+, and the yellow circles are representing the chloride ions, Cl-. Both of these diagrams are showing the lattice structure of sodium chloride, but in slightly different ways. And you need to be able to recognise diagrams like these as showing ionic compounds, and the big clues are, of course, the positive and negative charges, either shown on the ions themselves or in the key. There are three different ways of representing ionic compounds, but each has its own limitations. First of all, in dot and cross diagrams, these are great for showing the electron transfer between the atoms, and so how those ionic compounds are actually being formed. 
but they don't show the structure of the ionic compound, nor do they show the relative sizes of the ions or how they are arranged in three dimensions. The three-dimensional model is really good for showing the regular pattern of the ions in the ionic crystal lattice, as well as the relative sizes of the ions. But since they only show the outer layer of the compound, you can't quite see clearly what's happening inside the ionic lattice itself, and so it's hard to imagine those six different ions that surround each individual ion in the lattice. The ball and stick model is good for showing the regular pattern in the lattice, including how those ions are arranged. It can also be used to work out the ratio of ions in a lattice and therefore work out its formula. However, the ions in the ball and stick model are not always shown to scale, so the relative sizes are not always clear. Additionally, the big disadvantage of this model is it kind of suggests that there are gaps between the ions, and there definitely aren't really. In an exam, it's perfectly possible that you could be expected to suggest limitations about one or more of these different models. All compounds have a formula, or if we were talking about two or more compounds, we would say two formulae. Formulae typically show the number of atoms of each element in a compound. For instance, water has the formula H2O, meaning two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen in that molecule. Carbon dioxide is CO2, meaning one atom of carbon and two atoms of oxygen. However, for ionic compounds, for instance sodium chloride, there will be a huge number of ions in a 3D lattice. For example, in one grain of table salt, sodium chloride, there are typically 1.2 times 10 to the 18 sodium ions. So clearly, we couldn't write the formula for a grain of salt as Na. CL with those numbers in subscript, as the numbers would be far too big. Instead, we use something called the empirical formula. The empirical formula shows the ratio ions combine in in a three-dimensional lattice. For example, sodium chloride has the formula NaCl, which means there is one sodium ion for every chloride ion. And similarly, magnesium oxide is MgO, meaning one magnesium ion for every one oxide ion. And there could be billions and billions and billions of each of these ions, but they are present in a ratio of one to one, meaning there is an equivalent amount of each of them. For calcium chloride, the formula is CaCl2, meaning that for every one calcium ion in this compound, there are two chloride ions. And sodium oxide is Na2O, meaning for every one oxide ion, there will be two sodium ions. There are three different ways that you can use to work out the formula of an ionic compound. The first method involves looking at the electron transfer that takes place when that compound forms. For instance, for sodium oxide, sodium has got an atomic number of 11, which means it will have 11 protons and 11 electrons, and the electronic structure will be 281. And that means it's got one electron in its outer shell, which it needs to lose in order to have a full shell. Oxygen has an atomic number of 8, so 8 protons, 8 electrons, and then the electronic structure of 2,6, which means it's got 6 electrons in its outer shell, so it needs to gain another 2 electrons to fill that outer shell. And so what this tells us is that if sodium needs to lose one electron and yet oxygen needs to gain two, we need to have two sodium atoms and each of those atoms needs to lose their one outer shell electron. So that's two electrons being lost from those two separate sodium atoms and the oxygen atom will gain both of them to become an oxide ion. And so because of that ratio of what was involved in the electron transfer, the formula will be Na2O, which means that in the three-dimensional lattice, the ions are present in a two-to-one ratio of sodium ions to oxide ions. 
As a second example for magnesium fluoride, magnesium has got 12 as its atomic number, so 12 protons, 12 electrons, two electrons in its outer occupied shell. Fluorine has got nine as its atomic number, so nine protons, nine electrons, and seven electrons in its outer occupied shell. So magnesium needs to lose those two outer shell electrons, but fluorine only needs to gain one. And so what happens here is that magnesium will lose both of its electrons, but it will give one of them to one atom of fluorine and one to a second atom of fluorine. So two electrons being lost by that one magnesium atom and one electron being gained each by the two fluorine atoms. And so when we make magnesium fluoride, the formula is MgF2, which means we have two fluoride ions for each of those magnesium ions. You will usually be given the charges of the different ions when you're expected to work out a formula. So it's more likely that you might use this second method to work out the formula of a compound. And here we're looking for the common multiples of the positive charge and the negative charge. For instance, in copper chloride, copper has got a two plus charge and the chloride ion has a one minus charge. And so the common multiple here is two. And so what we need to do is we need to have multiples of one or both of these ions until we get the same amount of positive charge as we've got negative charge. Because the idea is those charges need to cancel each other out and the compound should not have any charge overall. And so here the common multiple is 2, and so we already have 2 from the copper 2 plus ion, and the chloride is 1, and so we need to have 2 of those chloride ions, so that gives us 2 positives and 2 negatives, and the formula would be CuCl2. Remember, a little 2 or any number in a formula needs to be a small number. As a second example, iron 3 bromide. The common multiple on this occasion, because the iron is a 3 plus charge and the bromide is 1 minus, the common multiple is 3. And so we already have 3 for the iron 3 plus, but the bromide we are currently with 1, so we need 3 of those bromide ions to have 3 negative charges overall. And so we would write the formula FeBr little 3. Some ions contain more than one different atom, and these are called molecular ions. Examples of this are the hydroxide ion, which is OH1-, nitrate, NO3-, and sulfate, SO4-. You'll come across those ions in different places in the course, and you'll usually be given them in a question like this. When you're writing a formula that contains more than one molecular ion, we need to use brackets in a similar way to how you use them in maths. For example, for magnesium hydroxide, the ions are Mg2+, and hydroxide is OH1-. The common multiple here is 2. Magnesium is already a 2+, plus. hydroxide is only 1-, minus, so we need a second hydroxide ion. When we write this, we need to write MgOH little 2, but if we left it like this, this would look like only two of the hydrogen. But we have got two of the hydroxide ion, so we need to put brackets around that hydroxide ion, and that little 2 means two of everything inside that bracket. One last example, aluminium nitrate, Al3+, plus NO3, 1 minus. We need to have a common multiple here of 3, so we need three of those nitrate ions, so it would be Al, NO3, 3. You can see even more clearly why we need the brackets here, because how I've written it right now looks like there's 33 oxygen, but there's of course not. There are three of that nitrate ion. So those brackets have gone around the nitrate ion, and we've got three of what is inside those brackets. This final method probably requires the least deduction and has some simple steps to follow, and so it's likely that this is the one that most people prefer. And I call it swap, drop, and simplify. 
and you start with the formulae of the ions, just like in the other method. And so if we have potassium sulfide, we have K, which is one plus and S, which is two minus. And the first step is to swap the charges for the two ions over. And so we get K2 minus and S1 plus. Right now, this method doesn't have much meaning, but it's helping us work towards the answer. The second step is to drop those numbers down onto the line. So you can see that two minus and that one plus have gone down to the bottom where numbers are typically shown in a formula. And the last step is to simplify. There are three things that you could need to do here, but we only need to actually do two on this occasion. The first is to get rid of the charges. So formulae never have a charge. And so that means we get rid of the plus and the minus. And then we simplify again by getting rid of the ones from a formula because the formulae shows the ratio of these ions. And in chemistry, if one of the numbers is a one in a formula, we just don't show. It. And so the formula of potassium sulfide is written K2S. As a second example, if we look at aluminium oxide, Al is 3 plus and O is 2 minus. And so we'll swap those numbers over, first of all, as our stage one. And since we know that at the end we're going to simplify out by removing the charges, we can do that before the end. And so I've done it actually as part of step one because I find it faster and clearer. Step two is to drop the numbers down onto the line. So the two goes down to behind the aluminium and the three goes down to behind the oxygen. And then we simplify by removing the charges, but I've already done that. We simplify by removing any ones. Well, there aren't any to remove. So actually we've already finished and the formula is Al2O3, meaning the aluminium and the oxygen are present in this ionic lattice in a two to three ratio. If we take a look at copper oxide, copper is two plus, oxide is two minus. So we swap those charges over and we get rid of the plus and the minus. And then we drop those numbers down onto the line. And then we look for simplifying. We've already got rid of the charges. There aren't any ones to remove. However, we do have a ratio of copper to oxide in a two to two ratio. So when we've got multiples of a ratio, we always need to simplify it down to the smallest whole number multiple, which when you've got two to two is a one to one ratio. And so the formula is CuO for copper oxide. One last example, if we had aluminium sulfate, this looks like it's going to be really complicated because aluminium is three plus and sulfate is two minus. We swap those charges over and we get rid of the plus and the minus. We then drop them down onto the line and we realize that we need brackets around the sulfate because we've got three of the sulfate ion. We double check, we've already got rid of the charges. There aren't any ones and our ratio is two to three, so it can't be simplified any further. And so this is finished. Our formula is Al little two SO4 inside brackets with a three after it. So I think you can see that this method is potentially much faster than the others. And usually this is why people prefer it.